Hello there, welcome back to Mike Reads the World. Today we're going to Singapore with The Art of Charlie Chan Hak Chai is the name of the book, and it's by the artist and uh, writer Sonny Liu. Um, this is a graphic novel, and probably the only book I'm going to read by Singa from Singapore, um, or a Singaporean author, unless uh, somebody um, gives me a convincing recommendation otherwise. But this was a very excellent graphic novel. It's a previous library book, but I did buy it used um, online, so uh, I do own it and look forward to going back to it in the future. It was really, really quite good. Um, now, this graphic novel opens right away with this sort of like, on, on the front in uh, set, what do you call this? I, I don't even know. The inside of the cover, has a dialogue of the longtime prime minister of Singapore and the guy who almost became the uh, prime minister of Singapore. There were kind of two rivals, um, and one of them was forgotten. The other is a celebrated, you know, longtime leader of Singapore. And uh, if you know anything about the countries, you probably know who those names are. And um, so this, and I didn't, by the way, going in, know anything about Singapore. Um, but it's told in this sort of frame story where you start out by interviewing. It's like, it's like this artist, Chan Hak Choi, is responding to, um, interview questions. And, uh, he's towards the end of his life, about 70 years old, reflecting back on it all. It kind of starts with his memories of childhood, how he started... Uh, writing comics and drawing comics, um, and uh, it really goes through just stylistically so all the decades, you know, of, of comic artistry. You can see here uh, very, you know, 1930s, and um, in all of it, ha a lot of it is like science fiction or fantasy or sort of like, uh, you know, animal cartoon strip. It goes through a whole range of styles. Um, but it all has some sort of social commentary about what's happening in Singapore at that time. Um, so here's like when you get into the 70s and 80s, really, really cool, unique artwork. Um, it's, it's long. There's a lot of, and that's a good thing. There's a lot of content, you know, in this book, um, and a lot to be learned. And um, not only that, but I I found sort of the main character of Charlie Chan Hak Chai, who is, you know, convincingly real. I frequently was forgetting that this is a fictional memoir of a fictional artist um, and, and had to kind of remind myself multiple times, like, because there's, you know, that this is that this is a... Uh, uh, being written by somebody else and it, you know about i mean you you have just these such like convincing sketches of uh you know story kind of like figuring out how he's going to draw his characters and stuff so i almost feel like this is sort of a meta you know the while the author was figuring out how to tell this story of singapore through a fictional artist he included i think a lot of his sort of formulative uh, drawings, but integrated that to make the story more immersive, so uh, the graphic novel more immersive. So I think that is brilliant. Um, yeah, definitely recommend at least getting this from the library and, and reading it if you can. Um, yeah, there's, there, there's really a lot to be said about it. The, the political tension, the, the political story of Singapore is really interesting, but if I can, I can sort of sum it up. Um, I'm not going to give, of course, any major spoilers, I guess, about what happens to uh, the artist or if he becomes famous or not. Uh, that's kind of, I guess, really the only... You're reading this for the art. The, the art is really just the highlight of this book, rather than, you know, exactly wanting to know what happens. But I guess knowing if Charlie Chan Hak Chai finds the success as a comic artist that he's looking for is really the only narrative thing that could be spoiled. So I guess I won't do that. Um, but if it, to sum up kind of the, the conflict that I learned about in Singapore here is that the prime, the longtime prime minister, um, 
Lee Kuan Yew uh, was obviously a, a figure who's very celebrated. He brought a lot of order and development, economic development, infrastructure development to Singapore very fast, very consistently, and for a long time. But a lot of what this book does is while it recognizes that, it recognizes the success of, uh, you know, that Singapore has had in this sort of capitalist, uh, you know, world, uh, global market development, um, and that it's found a successful place in that, it also looks at sort of the, you know, what was the cost of this? Because the measures that were put in place to make this happen, um, and it's quite arguable whether it couldn't have happened without these measures, um, you know, extremely restrictive press we see throughout the story, um, repression of art. There's decades during this story where um, Charlie Chan Hak Chai uh, languishes in obscurity and can't even work as a, as a political comic artist, even though he does that sort of um, style many times, um, but he simply cannot publish his work because you know, no newspaper will or can, and it's really quite, uh, you know, devilish how, uh, how the media is manipulated under this, you know, it's like, like, yeah, we'll allow some other newspapers to exist, but they're going to be controlled by the banks, which are, you know, obviously in favor of the policies that this prime minister had in place for so many years. And, um, yeah, all political opposition, all other visions for Singapore are simply shut down, there is a sort of interesting cultural element to all of this that Malaysia um, apparently at one point, from what I understand, of course, correct me if I'm wrong, um, didn't want Singapore to be part of Malaysia uh, because it would have influenced sort of the, the political parties with Singapore being ethnically more Chinese and Malaysia having their own, you know, Malay culture and and so on, and uh, and it would have shaken things up politically to include Singapore. Um, this sort of Chinese identity of Singapore is repressed in favor of a global English-based perspective for many decades, but then later revived and used conve for convenient political ends by the um, the the political forces in charge of Singapore to uh, say, for example, you know, this is how because of Confucianism and everything, this is why uh, the Chinese ethnicity needs to be, you know, dominated with such, you know, extreme measures of law and order and, uh, and put, um, put law and order above rights, you know, individual rights and freedom. And there's this sort of myth of the Eastern collectivism that, I think a lot of people even in the West have bought into. And I wonder, I, I don't know how true that is. I, I, I certainly question it. And the, the author of this book through his, his fictional artist um, and illustrator certainly questions this idea uh, that, that uh, this is something inherently cultural uh, to the East or to Chinese people that it's like they need this sort of collectivist uh, government, but I think he makes a very convincing case because that would be forgetting all of the, you know, the writers throughout Chinese, Korean, Japanese history that have written against the corrupt governments in charge. I mean, even if I think back to some of the Chinese uh, literature I read, like Water Margin and um, and, uh, oh, I'll, I'll say that one from Korea, Nine Cloud Dream, which was written in exile and in many ways probably criticizing the, uh, the Korean leader, at, uh, king at that time. This is the 1600s we're talking. So um, it's like political dissent has always been a thing everywhere. And the, um, you know... The idea of, a, of an individual having rights, it's not inherent to any culture. The Vikings weren't any more about, in my opinion, about individual rights than the, you know, ancient samurai were, or medieval samurai. It's like, I don't know, it, it, the book really does bring into, into play a lot of that question of, like, 
how actually inherent is culture to to this or is it a question of political control is it a question of uh um uh polit is is political culture separate from i guess historical culture i don't know the point is the point is that politicians and leaders definitely use myths about our current culture wherever you are to justify uh their means to an end so that was a really long tangent but <laughs> the uh to show more of the book i guess yeah the art of uh Charlie Chan Hak Chai was really excellent to read. There's like references to, you know, Roach Man. He gets bitten by a cockroach uh, and, and turns into a, a crime fighter. And then Spider-Man comes out some years later. So it's kind of a uh, wink and a, and a nod to that. Um, and is and I was noticing like, oh, this is a Spider-Man ripoff. But then the book kind of turns that around on you and you realize Spider-Man wasn't even invented yet. But that kind of goes to a comment that's made later in the book that, um, you know, Singapore doesn't have the population to reach critical mass of for a comic artist to make it big, you know, and that's an observation made later when uh, when Charlie Chan Hak Chai goes to a convention in the United States, um, just realizing that no matter what, He's always going to be seen. Whatever he does is going to be seen as a knockoff of the bigger United States, uh, Japanese, or, you know, s somebody from a bigger country with a bigger population did it first, always, no matter, you know, that that's how he's going to be seen. And there is something to that, especially as, you know, I'm reading, I'm reading the world and reading some more obscure countries. I'm starting to realize, like, I can, I should not and definitely do not all you know, assume that just because it's from a more obscure country and a lesser known book, if it does something similar to say something that a great canonical Western author does, I remove myself from that. I do my best to remove myself from that and say, no, this is its own thing. I'm going to take it on its own terms. I'm going to enjoy it on its own terms and, uh, and, and have found a lot of surprises while reading the world and a lot of very totally new literary experiences that I don't think that somebody who only sticks to the canon is, uh, is going to find. So, um, there, there was a point in this project where I was very like, yeah, let's stick to the canon as much as possible. And, and I still am on some level like that. I try to read as many of the great classics as I can while doing this project, but I have, I also, um, I also feel that I've gotten a lot of out of uh, by having to read a book from every country, reading things that come from outside the canon, and uh, it gives me just new windows, points of comparison. So that's my two cents on that, and something that you know this book brought up as a theme and made me think about. So yeah, it's it is um, not again not to knock graphic novels, but it is deeper than your average graphic novel on many levels in the political realm, in the, um, the, the, you know, so global socio, so, social, um, I don't know. How do I say that? Kind of how, how a person from a, from a smaller, a country with a smaller population can fit into the global cultural, uh, picture. And, uh, yeah, new perspective there. So I definitely recommend The Art of Charlie Chan Hak Chai. Um, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Mike Reads the World.